first, for the third time, full disclosure, I didn't buy this BNC model P4025T. It was sent to me by the Berkeley Nucleonics Corporation, free of charge, for review. The first time I told you that was in the unboxing where I covered yeah, physical dimensions, screen size, screen quality, uh, etc. Yeah, switching it on and off. Uh, card link. Uh, the second time I told you that was in the first part of this review where I covered the channel controls, the horizontal, vertical and trigger controls as well as the performance of that thing. Uh, yeah, card link. And now we are in the second part of the review where I will talk about all the auxiliary functions or extended functions that scope offers. Again, it's a <laughs> very long video, so feel free to use a time index in the description down below. And uh, yeah, with that, uh, let's start. Let's start with the math menu I skipped in the first part. So I have here a, yeah, a squarish 10 megahertz waveform and a 10 megahertz sine wave. And I won't repeat every setting with knobs and buttons versus touch screen. I will just use what yeah feels better to me. Um, yeah, uh, of course we have waveform math, so you can uh, select the channels which you want to do math with. All four channels available, what you expect, and you can do. Uh, the sum of the curves, yeah, the pink line is your math function. Uh, you can, yeah, subtract the curves from each other. You can multiply them and you can divide them. And this looks a little bit uh, fancy here. Um, that's of course channel one divided by channel two. So divided by the sine wave and the sine wave goes through zero <laughs> at one point, uh, you got here basically something uh, that's invalid. Yeah, some value divided by zero. Yeah, it's invalid. So let's go here to the scale or yeah, uh, infinity, I could say. Let's go here to the scale and scale that up a little bit. Uh, or down and then yeah, yeah you can see the result. So yeah of course you can scale the whole thing and interestingly that works very good on the touch screen. You can move it. Well it works kind of but yeah for that I already mentioned that in part one. I do prefer using the knob. Yeah, and uh, that's all what there is to say about uh, math. Uh, yeah, um, it goes to that thin line mode, which basically means it doesn't do any averaging anymore. So um, yeah, it really does the pure math, only these functions and uh, it also displays the input signals in raw form. If I switch off math, yeah, you see it, the thicker lines, that means it's ever averaging over several waveform samples, which it doesn't if you activate the math. Okay, let's continue and play a little bit with the fast Fourier transformation. So of course you can choose every channel as a source. Let's stay with channel two, that is a sine wave. And you can choose different windows. And without going too deep into fast Fourier transformation, uh, 
each window uh, represents or has a trade-off between frequency resolution, yeah, how accurate it can determine the frequency and how accurate it can determine the amplitude for that frequency. And uh, yeah, Henning is a good compromise here. Um, format, you can choose either decibels or RMS voltage. And if you're looking at the face, oh, this is a very sharp peak here for the sine wave. Uh, <laughs> very sharp um, and you have radian respectively degrees if you want to see the phase shift of course uh, yeah you want don't see any phase shifts between the different frequency contents of your signal on huh, a single sine wave maybe we play a little bit with the uh, rectangular wave here so let's go back to decibels and yeah here you have your peak of the sine wave that should be about 10 megahertz of course you can adjust your center frequency this is at the moment 62.5 megahertz of your window and let's pull that down here to 10 megahertz exactly and yeah there is a little bit of a, a, if you turn it very fast your frequency changes very fast if you turn it let's go back to 10 very slow your frequency changes very slow and you can change the width of your FFT window here so it's currently 12.5 meg and I cannot make it any broader uh, but I can go down to 6.25 max and yeah these are the only two options I have here in the moment and what options you get here for yeah megahertz per division displayed up here is basically dependent on your acquisition mode i'm currently at 12 bits and your center frequency for example if i go down to 8 bit mode Yeah, first of all, it resets my center frequency. That's a bit of an annoyance, but uh, yeah, we can change that very fast back to our 10 megahertz. And now I have here more options, 6.25 meg. 25 meg yeah we saw that but I also have whoop yeah a little bit fiddly here 12.5 meg and if you lower your free uh, your center frequency of the window uh, you get lower frequency options here um, of course you can also adjust your position and scale of your window so yeah, we can move that up a little bit here. Let's say two divisions and yeah, we can change the scale. Yeah, and uh, what else? Um, yeah, of course you can display your peak. So at 10 megahertz and uh, yeah, my, this is millidecibel minus, uh, yeah, about 15,000 millidecibel. So uh, minus 15 decibel is our 10 megahertz peak. And we have something called a user function. And there you can do basically everything. You can say, okay, uh, 
channel one, I want minus channel two. Yeah, that would be easy, but you can also say I want the square root of channel one. And then you get <laughs> the square root of channel one, which is uh, quite interesting. Obviously, it has a little problem here with negative values, um, you know, uh, imaginary values. It cannot display. Uh, so let's take something else. Let's take the square from channel one. And yeah, you, you can make really complex functions here. I won't, oops, I won't dive into it. Not the square root. I want the square. Oh, there's no square. Okay, then channel one times channel one. That's the square. Yeah, that works much better. Yeah, as I said, you can do arbitrary functions here with that stuff. And finally, we have dir, D-I-R, which implements a, yeah, a digital filter on your signal. And it only works on channel one and channel two. And wherever, whatever channel you choose is the only channel that will still be active and the other one will be deactivated. A little bit annoying is, <laughs> in that case is, uh, if you choose channel two, in my case, uh, I lose a trigger because the trigger is running on channel one. So let's ch stay on channel one. And you have, yeah, the usual filter types available, uh, low pass, band pass, high pass, band pass, and band reject. As with the FFT, you can choose what window should be used by the algorithm. So Henning, rectangular, tapered, yeah, the whole bunch. And you can choose, of course, uh, the cut off frequency, the lowest cut off frequency you can set here. In this case for 10 megahertz signal is 50 megahertz, but uh, well, it goes up to one gigahertz. <clears throat> um, Anyway, you can also adjust, sorry, adjust the vertical position of your output, of course. Yeah, and if you choose, uh, yeah, let's say a band path, then you have, of course, two frequencies. You can set the upper and the lower frequency. So lower frequency, 50 megahertz, that's okay. Upper frequency, 100 megahertz, yeah, let's go. Bit up here, yeah. Of course, uh, nothing will happen abo uh, above 200 megahertz. So um, yeah, um, if you need it to see, yeah, analog, yeah, digitally filtered your signal, um, nice function. So we're through with the math. So let's deactivate that and get our second channel online. And we continue with the function buttons up here. So the first one is measure, but before I go into the measure menu, I want to talk about that snap thing, which is quite neat because if you press it, you get for a specific channel, uh, which you have set inside measurement, basically all the measurements you could ever want as a yeah one-time snapshot, snapshot. So this is not uh, continuously updating. For example, if I offline here uh, change the frequency, yeah, you see nothing happens here in the snapshot. Uh, but basically just to, yeah, 
know what is uh, at the moment my peak to peak voltage, uh, what is my base voltage, what is the mean voltage. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's quite handy. So let's get that snap here out of the way and enter the measure menu and you see here these two options snapshot window on off and the snapshot source which is currently channel one uh channel two i can change that of course to channel one and if i then do a snap i get the values for channel one mm, nice shortcut Beyond just a snapshot, you can of course add measurements and <laughs> a whole slew of them. And I won't test <laughs> all of them uh, to your display permanently. So yeah, let's say we want to Add the amplitude and the mean value for channel one and then you have them displayed down here permanently. And we can do the same for amplitude channel two and mean value channel 2. They're nicely stacked here. At that point we might want to check out what happens if we go into the acquire menu and change to 12-bit mode. Okay, you don't get more decimals but uh, yeah, for 8-bit <laughs> mode these, um, yeah, Four digits is um, a little bit too much for significant digits. And uh, yeah, for 12-bit, yeah, you can trust them. But uh, yeah, in 8-bit mode, these are probably interpolated values. And you see they are a little bit, uh, yeah, jumping around at a more coarse level. So yeah, 6.15 and 5.570. This is quite a big jump. And I go to 12 bit, then it jumps at 540550. Yeah, so this is also really using the 12 bit resolution. You can set or 40 bit resolution. To remove the whole thing, uh, yeah, I have to go to the measure menu again, of course. Yeah, you can select the measurement you want to remove. And it says what measurement and which channel, because they are, uh, obviously you can't see it here, but I can remove the main for channel one, dash, it's gone and the mean for channel two, it's gone. And I really like the fact that uh, the different measurements, uh, yeah, let's add some more channel one stuff here. RMS, cycle RMS, overshoot, pre-shoot, yeah, that he is, it's stacking up here quite nicely and uh, not only in one line and uh, you really have the ability to remove measurements selectively. Huh. Yeah, that measurement stuff is quite nice. That uh, leaves us only with the, yeah, remove all button. And then uh, we can continue, I guess, uh, with the acquire menu and most of it length and perf mode. We already talked about that in part one. 
the acquisition mode you have your normal sample yeah your run of the mill acquisition mode you have also a peak detect yeah in our waveform this doesn't change anything but basically it only uh, yeah takes the maximum and minimum values at a certain point in the waveform into consideration you can do an average yeah over 4 16 64 or 128 samples which gives you of course because it's only the average value a thin line single pixel line and uh, for reasons unbeknownst to me but you have the options you can lower the refresh rate mm. okay let's get back here to normal values and yeah look into the interpolation menu mm, box standard Either you have sine x over x, the usual, or you have linear interpolation that is only drawing yeah, lines, straight lines between your sample points. And yeah, that's it for the acquisition menu. So let's continue with uh, yeah, not the auto set. We covered that in part one, two with the utility menu. And yeah, as the name says, utility. So you can configure a whole bunch of stuff. The yeah, language, I won't change that. Uh, oh, I changed it. Uh, uh, let's go back to English, please. Um, you can set the time obviously there's a real-time clock in here because I never set it uh, and it was disconnected from mains power and it still shows the correct time and you can obviously display it if you want to uh, oh key lock <laughs> uh, yeah let's activate the key lock <clears throat> and now all keys whatever you do are locked uh, which is in a real lab a handy function if you have yeah doing some long time measurements and you want to avoid uh, somebody accidentally yeah uh, stopping the measurement or changing parameters and <laughs> the way to get out of that is quite interesting uh, yeah menu force menu force menu force yeah and you have unlocked about, uh, it again about yeah displays your zero number your uh, firmware checksum and uh, your most important your firmware version oh what else uh display yeah there you have quite a uh, some options like uh yeah changing the backlight intensity or yeah your coordinate system to different styles yeah i like that actually a little bit better i don't know if you can see that on screen um yeah i have no battery installed and of course the menu timeout can be adjusted too uh, yeah adjust okay self calibration uh, setting everything to default I won't activate that now uh, yeah disconnect all probes click calibration again um, probe calibration yeah with the calibration signal here no surprises at all it has a pass fail function output again for pass fail uh, you can use the trigger out yeah if you want to activate some other equipment on a fail or pass device PC or picked I have 
or USB. I have no idea what the pick is at the moment. I would have to look that up, but uh, yeah. Lancet, yeah, you saw also in, uh, I think in the unboxing, there's a LAN connection in here and this only has LAN, this unit. There are units available with wireless LAN as an option. Um, and of course, update if you want to update the firmware. But yeah, that's it with the utility menu box standard. You usually don't need it. Let's continue with something more interesting, the cursor. And I have to say the cursor menu is actually quite nice to handle. I mean uh, with a multi-purpose button. Of course you can take a cursor line and yeah move it on the touch screen <laughs> as always. But uh, yeah with the multi-function button here multi-purpose it's actually quite nice to set the cursor lines. And at the moment I only have the voltage cursors, so yeah. Let's box in our square wave here. And besides only voltage, you can have only the time cursors or time and voltage cursors. And you also have an auto cursor, but uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure if this is really useful. It's there, but uh, yeah. So time and voltage. If you want to switch between time and voltage, and let's remove the menu here, uh, you do this via this menu button. Now I can adjust the time, let's say here exactly the zero crossing of our square wave to the other zero crossing. Yeah, and <laughs> 10 megahertz, of course, uh, because it's a yeah 10 megahertz square wave and yeah, you get the values displayed. So um, nothing special, but uh, this function handles really well. Uh, of course, you can change the source to channel two. Let's say uh, we still get almost the same values. Uh, I need the voltage. Let's adjust the B line. Yeah. This is, if you really want to measure your curve, you know, beyond the standard measurements, let's say, for example, uh, you really want to see, yeah, with all the ringing here. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Uh, you can move both boxes, so amplitude and time in parallel if you want. So let's get our A line down here. Yeah, and uh, of course, change back to source one. Quite neat. Okay, um, let's continue cursor um, with the auto scale here and switch the cursor off to get some real estate back here on the screen. So the auto scale is very similar to the auto set, which we saw in part one, but it works dynamically. The auto set, yeah, does an auto set on your input signals once the auto scale works dynamically. So if I put auto scale on, it automatically scales your waveforms again. And for example, if I change now the frequency down of the square wave here and look at the time base, yeah, going down. Oh, no, I'm going up. Sorry. 
9 megahertz, 8, 7, 6, 5, and it changes automatically the time base. 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay. And yeah, it works in the other direction. I'm going to 10 megahertz again. Exactly the same. Uh, it also works uh, with the amplitude. And now I'm decreasing the amplitude here. And yeah, you will see, okay, five volts, four volts, three volts, clock, changes the scale, two volt, one volt, clock, changes the scale. And you can actually say here, if it just should uh, do that for frequency and amplitude, for frequency only, or for amplitude only. And you can also say, uh, do you want to see uh, several waveforms in the window or just one waveform in the window? So yeah, let's go up with the amplitude again. Two volts, three volts, yeah, scaling down. Four volts, five volts, scaling down. Frequency, I'm going, uh, we are at 10 megahertz. Yeah, 10 nanoseconds time base, 9 megahertz, 8, 7, 6, 5, yeah, changes time base, 4, 3, 2, 1, changes time base. Um, that's a, might come in handy if you're probing around uh, some board with a whole lot of different signals uh, with uh, different amplitudes, different frequencies, and uh, you don't want to fumble with your horizontal and vertical control all the time or uh, press the auto set button all the time. You just yeah put your probe on a signal and it will dynamically scale the display so you have at least an idea uh, yeah how the signal looks like. And, Cannot, if you really want to look at the re, uh, waveform, replace some fine tuning here, but uh, yeah, quite neat. So let's get back up here to our 10 megahertz signal and switch the auto scale off. And then we move forward to the save button. And <laughs> you can actually save a lot of things. First of all, you can save the waveform. Not a picture of it, but really the digital data. And you have here the option to save it as binary text or comma separated value file, which is not working at the moment because I'm using the internal storage. If you use external storage, that is a USB stick, which uh, I think uh, has to be formatted. Yeah, it has to be formatted as FAT32 with 4K blocks or something. Yeah, that's in the manual. Uh, then you can actually use also a text file and comma separated value file. But uh, yeah, I don't have a USB stick here, so let's stick with the internal. Okay, and if I actually select a source and you see here, you can yeah, select any active channel, four and three are not active at the moment. Let's say I want to save that nice sine wave here from channel two, I've selected that. Storage is internal, perfect. And then I can just Save that. Dush. Wonderful. So what can I do with it now? <laughs> uh, let's switch channel two off for a moment. Go back to our save menu. And of course I can show the object now. Wave zero, I hope I, yeah. 
save that to wave zero yeah and here is our waveform so close all and go back to the wave and maybe switch our channel two on again yeah save menu and besides the digital data yeah of your signals you can uh yeah let's do that first uh also of course save the image but uh yeah saving the image that only works if a usb stick is actually connected uh yeah these two belong a little bit together uh you can also save the configuration and you have eight slots where you can save the configuration so the current configuration i could save to slot seven okay saved and now i could change something and load that configuration again that's quite handy if you do really you know production lab work and uh, you have uh, eight different setups uh, for measuring things that you measure over and over again um yeah image uh, record record also is yeah falls in the same category as image and wave but uh, works again in a different way if i switch the record mode on i can first select and we are in record mode uh, how many frames i want to record so this is almost like yeah taking a movie of your waveforms so i have a maximum of thousand frames uh, yeah more is not possible but less is and i take a snapshot every 10 milliseconds uh, that's a little bit fast let's do uh, i don't know 50 milliseconds or so yeah now we can simply say okay uh, operate uh, this should this should uh, be labeled record but anyway we can say play and if i change now here a little bit or play around with the settings of the function generator with my right hand so out here yeah let's do that and say stop and go to playback and in playback again you have the possibility to say okay start frame end frame and i fear yeah i only captured 374 frames which is okay count frame is frame one so you can now if you want go through it frame by frame and yeah the playback speed you can also yeah let's set that also to 50 milliseconds like we recorded it so it's real time you can speed that up or yeah slow it down and by the way the intervals can be set between yeah tenth of milliseconds and yeah 99.9 .9 seconds so between 0.1 milliseconds and 99.9 .9 seconds but uh yeah let's play it back with the same speed 50 milliseconds and yeah now we can play back what we have recorded either once so yeah the few seconds i was playing back there or in a loop if you want and that's that's handy for changing signals yeah like uh yeah like i manipulated the signal generator if the signal changes you you can actually record that yeah what else uh clone this function really <laughs> yeah makes sense if you have the built-in function generator because 
Now, if you have a signal, you can uh, yeah, select a part of the signal. Uh, you know that uh, that's like the cursor stuff. Yeah, you can move line A, let's say to here, the uh, yeah, falling edge, line B. Yeah, it's exactly the same to that falling edge. So we have exactly one waveform between the cursors. You have also the possibility to uh, select the whole screen, by the way. Um, you can take that portion of the signal and my source is currently channel one. You can also have two channels selected. So channel one and channel two. And <laughs> yeah, uh, here comes the caveat. If you have a built-in function generator, you can now save that, yeah, to the function generator as a custom waveform and your function generator output at the back will replicate that waveform. Uh, yeah, or you can save it to USB, uh, only that part of the waveform if you, yeah, want that. And uh, I guess that completely concludes our save menu and uh, we can continue with display. Uh, let me first stop cloning because otherwise that window will remain here on the screen for whatever reasons. So it's better uh, yeah, to go back to wave and then we can continue, yeah, menu off. I mentioned that button often enough to the display menu. And yeah, we already used uh, switching between dots and vector and vector of course utilizes, we saw that in the acquisition menu, either the sine x over x interpolation or linear interpolation. And before I go over to persistence and color mode, I uh, yeah, should put on some more interesting signals here. Just give me a second. So I have here now a 10 megahertz sine wave, which is modulated with a phase shift key with a 100 kilohertz sine wave. And yeah, I mean, you see the uh, main carrier, yeah, the 10 megahertz, but uh, <clears throat> something going on here. And sorry. And yeah, persist mode, yeah. Let's you see, let's say persistence one second. Let's you see what's going on in the background, the signals more clearly. And so you have one signal, uh, one second, two seconds, five seconds and infinity. Um, coloration, that gives you a coloration. Yeah, you know, these color diagrams, normally it's eye diagrams where you can see, uh, yeah, red, from the red to the light blue, uh, yeah, the um, intensity, how often, yeah, that particular waveform is actually sampled. And you see, yeah, red, our carrier, it's sampled there and blue, still a little bit flickery, uh, is the modulated signal. Um, uh, let me change the modulation to something else like uh, amplitude modulation. Ah, yeah, there the color mode shines. So yeah, you see in red, yeah, the nice outline where our signal is uh, most of the time. I mean, this is a, a, a qualitative uh, rendering of the signal, these color modes. And here in yellow, where the signal is only uh, spends uh, very little time. I mean, you have a sine wave, mod uh, sine wave modulating the signal. So yeah, sine wave, uh, yeah, here we have a sine wave. You spend a whole lot of time in the extremes, in the low and the high, and you 
spend only very little time yeah, here in between uh, in the intermediate values. Okay, uh, moving on to XY mode and I need other signals for that too to show it. Okay, I have on channel 1 a 10 MHz sine wave and on channel 2 a 5 MHz sine wave. And if we enable XY mode, sorry, yeah, it always refers to channel 1 and channel 2. You cannot choose the other channels or uh, yeah, reverse the channel 1 and 2 for XY mode. That's a limitation, but the XY mode itself, let me get the menu out of the way, it's nice. It has this combination screen display where you see the, uh, yeah, the most important data of each channel and you see your fee in radians and grade, uh, radians and grade, degrees, sorry. Uh, it's nice and uh, yeah, you can play with it. And uh, if I decrease the amplitude of my channel two, you see that the center here of my eight, and of course you get an eight when you have uh, yeah, uh, twice the frequency on one channel or half the frequency on the other, what way you wanna look at it it wanders off from the center line. And you can also here see that uh, the zero crossing a little bit offset. Yeah, you can detect such things with the XY mode. And uh, yeah, let's get the amplitude up. So they are almost identical. And uh, yeah, it's nice, uh, but of course you have also the full screen XY mode, which still displays you the most important data here on that side. And yeah, mm, I like it. And if you want, you can combine that with persistent mode. Yeah, if you don't like the dotted lines here, you can say persistence to let's say five seconds or infinity, doesn't matter. And then you get a closed line, okay? And yeah, you can play with it. Okay, five seconds persistent mode would have been more appropriate. But anyway, uh, let's get persistence mode off again. Ah, sorry persistence off again and XY mode off again. And let's continue with the counter functionality, which should be yeah, quite easy, but useful. You simply switch the counter on and it yeah, gives you the frequency for, again, always channel one. But yeah, you can have the frequency measure here in the bottom right of your display. And that concludes all of the display functionality. Uh, don't ask me why the XY mode is in display. Uh, yeah, you just have to know that, but it's okay. I really, yeah, you notice that I like the XY mode. <laughs> Okay, um, let's move on then. There's of course a help menu and you can navigate that with the buttons down here. Yeah, the screen buttons or uh, the physical buttons or the multi-purpose button. Yeah, how to measure automatically and yeah, you get a lot of text, no pictures. Yeah, click again on the multi purpose button and you get back. Uh, as I said, you cannot uh, yeah, navigate down here as well. And uh, yeah, that's nice. On the previous, on um, the next page, uh, there is all the help for the optional stuff, which is not included in the unit I got for review. Yeah, 
this is really uh, the raw unit without any options installed. So, uh, yeah, you can reset everything back to <laughs> default. Okay, any other key to quit and press default again. Yeah, so uh, I press another key and <laughs> okay. No attached pick printer. Yeah, that would be the next function here. Uh, yeah, if you have a pick printer attached to the USB port on the back, yeah, you can directly print your screen content. Uh, yeah, decode. We have to set up the trigger for serial bus to go uh, into decode mode. So I'm decoding here an SPI signal and to do that you have first to set up in the trigger menu a bus trigger for SPI. So yeah I'm triggering off the SPI clock here. So you can select the clock in the trigger and the data line, which is my blue trace. Uh, you can select a timeout. Yeah, the usual. It's not critical in our case. And yeah, clock edge, how many data bits, uh, yeah, current bits, uh, data high, low, or Undefined. Hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, setting a filter there. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. Um, all bits. Please. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, set the trigger out accordingly. Uh, and then you can go into the decode mode and choose your bus. So yeah, SPI here. And you can also here do some con uh, configuration, clock, timeout, data bits. Yeah, we already saw that. Least significant bit or most significant bit first. Data bits, we can, yeah, it's eight data bits. Hmm. Yeah, it's two groups with eight bits each. And you can display, yeah, uh, let's start at the bottom, an ASCII table if you want to. Uh, yeah, you can save the event table and you can display the event table. I'm just tracing here one bit, uh, yeah, one burst of data at the moment. And you can choose the format. So hex or decimal. Yeah, that's it. I'm a little bit uh, fuzzy about that it's not triggering at the moment uh, both groups, but only one group. Um, uh, yeah, DAC is optional, not installed. PF, pass fail. I won't go into the pass fail. You simply, yeah, you have your reference waveform and you set up a rule. Uh, yeah, horizontal, vertical, maximum deviation from your reference and then you do create. And of course, uh, you can save different rules. And you can decide what output you want. Yeah, want you stop the scope? Uh, yeah, uh, run stop, no. Uh, but we want to display the info and we don't want to beep. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, pass or fail is obviously referencing if you do a beep or a stop. So either it stops or beeps on pass or on fail. We don't do either, we just want to display the info, which is currently 0, 0, 0, 0 pass, 0 fail, 0 total. And then you can 
operate it start and you say uh, at the moment I'm yeah of course passing but if for example I now lower the amplitude I start to fail until I'm back in my amplitude range and that's yeah really easy to use uh, I thought it would be more complicated but that's really okay what else uh, waveform record yeah we already looked at that too uh, and that's it I think I covered each and every of the extended functions of this scope um, in the end you have to be the judge if it's yeah fitting your purpose your requirements my impression so far the user interface is very consistent uh, I think there were only uh, yeah, two little things I stumbled about uh, like uh, in the waveform recording you have to play <laughs> press play instead of record to start the recording and I think the lower cutoff frequency in the digital bandpath uh, filter was called uh, down uh, instead of lower but uh, yeah that's it that's um, all I stumbled about for now um, the implementation of the functions themselves um, yeah kind of a mixed bag uh, there are a lot of neat things like yeah that snap that uh, displays all the data for a channel that's very nice and uh, yeah the uh, XY mode is very nice um, but then there are things like the uh, fast Fourier transformation where eh, you could do a little bit more like uh, for example uh, implement a real cursor where you can uh, scroll through the spectrum and it says uh, gives you the decibels or volts RMS for a certain frequency instead just having uh, I think it was a peak detection where it uh, gives you the data for the highest peak. Um, yeah, one thing's for sure, there is nothing really missing, okay? Uh, it has every function uh, yeah, you expect from such a scope. Um, as I said, not all of these functions are yeah implemented to perfection they all seem to work but uh yeah there's still a little feeling it could they could have done a little bit more with the firmware that said you wouldn't buy such a scope uh, because of the extended functionality you would buy it because of the performance that is especially the 12-bit and 14 bit mode it provides and with that I say bye